result of increased uh, numbers of people in the city is the growth of theater and popular music. <clears throat> Usually theaters would be, ba would be neighborhood theaters and would essentially be ethnic. So you would have a, a theater in a Chinese neighborhood and pretty much only Chinese folks would go there or an Irish neighborhood or Puerto Rican or whatever it may be. New American forms of entertainment will dominate. Musical comedy and vaudeville uh, will, will be the, the, the most popular forms. Vaudeville is a variety show featuring musicians, comedians, magicians, jugglers, dancers, skits, that sort of thing. And it will be the dominant form of American entertainment from the late 1800s well into the 1920s, uh, really up until the Great Depression. Vaudeville had a, a, a huge and, and uh, very impressive heyday. The most famous vaudeville show was the Ziegfeld Follies, which would come out every year with a new show uh, in New York on Broadway and then spread throughout the country. Blacks were actually allowed to perform in vaudeville. In fact, blacks were many of the great stars of vaudeville. Um, and these come from the old minstrel shows, which we talked about earlier in the 19th century. Uh, some whites, uh, following this tradition of blacks being the, the primary entertainers in vaudeville, would paint themselves black uh, in what we call blackface. You see Al Jolson up there on the top. Uh, in blackface performing as a, as a white guy painted black. The music was based on, uh, uh, of the time was based on a, a fusion of gospel music and folk music that comes from the plantations, often slave music. Now this would, would create the, the genre originally of what we call ragtime music, um, which was very piano based and kind of uh, upbeat and jaunty. Uh, Scott Joplin is the king of ragtime. You can see he's a black guy there. And then uh, ragtime will evolve into jazz. Louis Armstrong is, is probably the most important uh, uh, figure in the history of jazz music. He's the guy there with the uh, trumpet. And we'll talk more about uh, uh, the evolution of American forms of music as we go along in later chapters. Movies would also be developed at this time. The movies were invented by Thomas Edison and his staff of inventors there in Menlo Park in the 1880s. They start out as peep shows, these little things you can just look into a little viewfinder and see a very small uh, uh, movie. But it was a moving picture, and that's what was exciting about it. You would find these in penny arcades, amusement parks, maybe pool halls. But eventually we developed the large projector, so you can go sit in a room with a bunch of other people and watch a movie up on a screen. Uh, it, was, it wasn't as big as we think of screens now, but it was much bigger than the peep show. And by 1900, people all over the country would file into theaters and cities uh, to watch these things. Now, the original movies had no plot. They would literally just take a camera out and film anything. They filmed a wedding. There's a very famous uh, uh, early movie of two old people kissing, uh, somebody walking around a park, or actually setting their camera up and, and filming people in a park. Um, then they began to film plays. And so they would basically put on a play like you might see in a theater and just set up a camera and film the whole thing, and that would be the movie. It's really going to be D.W. Griffith who's going to create what we think of as movies. And this is a, an, a story um, told through the use of the camera and editing. So you'll have different shots. You may have a close-up shot and a faraway shot. You may show a picture of one person talking and then another person talking to establish that they're having a conversation. Now, unfortunately, D.W. Griffith's great masterpiece where he establishes these techniques is called Birth of a Nation. It comes out in 1915, and it tells the story of poor Southern whites who are being picked on by the mean black people who've been freed. It's said during Reconstruction after the Civil War. And the heroic Ku Klux Klan is formed by the whites to murder the black people. Um, it's a disturbing movie, and it disturbed people at the time, to be fair. And the next year, he'll make another masterpiece, Intolerance, uh, where he kind of, uh, uh, which is often considered to be kind of his apology for the racism of Birth of a Nation. Although Birth of a Nation was incredibly popular, in fact, it sold more tickets than there were people in the United States. So the average American saw it more than once. Stadiums. Uh, oh, real quick, I should also say this about movies. They didn't have start times. You would just go to the movie, buy your ticket, and walk in and watch from wherever you came in, and then wait until it came back around. So you might watch the middle and the end, and then watch the beginning. Uh, they didn't post start times. People watching was a major attraction. Uh, imagine in a farm, you don't see a lot of people. You don't see, but in a city, you see hundreds if not thousands of people every day. And of course, as it is today, people like to go out and see and be seen. Dance halls, vaudeville shows, concert halls, uh, parks like Central Park were all places you might go out just to people watch. Uh, movie theaters and sports stadiums, of course, as well, uh, would be great for this sort of thing. And here we see some of the early baseball stadiums. A lot of these, of course, will become uh, legendary. There's Ebbets Field on the bottom uh, uh, left, um, it, which was in Brooklyn. Uh, the Polo Grounds is up here. Uh, uh, Forbes Field where the Pirates played. 
We also have amusement parks. Coney Island is going to be the king of entertainment destinations. That's where everybody uh, wants to be to have a good time. Luna Park will open on Coney Island in 1903, providing rides, stunts, reproduction of exotic locales. They would actually take entire uh, villages of African uh, natives, pygmies, for example, move them here, and then set them up like a zoo exhibit. You could ride an elephant. They would have... Uh, um, Adventures. You could uh, tour through a Japanese garden. You could take a ride on a Venetian gondola. Uh, you could go to a Chinese theater. They would have trips to the moon. They weren't really trips to the moon. They were just rides. Uh, escapes from burning buildings, earthquakes, and they would try to simulate all these things in the park. It's very popular. Uh, it, a competitor opened called Dreamland in 1904 that was even more elaborate. It featured a 375-foot tower you could go to the top of, a three-ring circus, chariot races, a munchkin village, which, of course, were, were dwarves. Thousands of people came from New York City and from all over the country uh, by subway after 1920 uh, to visit Luna Park in Dreamland. In 1904, Luna Park averaged 90,000 attendees a day uh, in attendance. Uh, and, and one of the things about these places was they were kind of places you could go and get in trouble. Lots of times young people, teenagers would go out there. The girls would, have, would be a little racier, maybe dress up a little more scandalous than they would. You might make out with a boy you don't know. Uh, historians have established pretty clearly that these were places where um, uh, people went to kind of misbehave. Uh, the rides would force physical contact, so if you were sweet on a girl, you might try to get her on one of these rides because she'd end up all smushed up against you. Uh, and, and that was uh, how people got their kicks back at the turn of the century. We're also going to have non-public forms of entertainment. The dime novel, through improvements in uh, uh, publishing, will become much cheaper to produce and a lot more people will read them. They'll become very popular after the Civil War. Uh, rising literacy due to increased public education um, and, and cheaper printing techniques will put books in people's homes all over the country, uh, whereas they used to be fairly expensive. Books on the Wild West, science fiction, uh, books of uh, moral uplift, uh, showing people who... Um, kind of fallen uh, morally and then they find themselves again. Uh, uh, animals, romance, um, stories about young women growing up, for example, uh, Little Women will sell over two million copies, be one of the most popular books of the day. Um, lots of stories like this one up here, The Wolves of New York, where women leave the farm, go into the city, and then they kind of fall into bad behavior, by which I mean sleeping around. And then they, of course, in the end figure out that that's a bad idea and go marry the nice boy that they should have married in the beginning. Between 1870 and 1910, uh, newspaper circulation will explode, too. It goes from under 3 million in 1870 to over 9 million in 1910. The newspaper circulation is growing three times faster than population growth, and newspapers are becoming more profitable as well. We begin to separate news and opinion. People talk about as if news has just progressively gotten worse. That's not actually true. Uh, up until about the Civil War, all news was opinion. There wasn't really anything you would call news. But, but reporting becomes a profession during the late 1800s, where reporters uh, adopt this, uh, try to begin this, this notion of just the facts and just telling people what happened, and the opinion page becomes a separate thing. The Newswire, which we talked about before, allows news stories to be transmitted all over the country and in the world for that matter. So your local newspaper has stories from every city and every state and, and many countries around the world. Uh, newspapers consolidate. Uh, great newspaper men will buy up lots of newspapers in lots of towns. Um, uh, Hearst and his newspapers. Um, will buy up, uh, uh, by 1914 he had nine, he controlled nine newspapers and two magazines. We, uh, uh, layouts become more elaborate. What the, they can actually put onto the page becomes much more complicated and eventually we're going to have color uh, drawings at first and then photographs. Uh, readers love the photographs and readership and ad sales continue to go up and up and up and it creates uh, a more literate and a more well-informed society. We should also mention the telephone. The telephone was invented by, among others, Alexander Graham Bell in 1876. Originally, you had to have direct wires connecting two telephones, so you could only talk to somebody your phone was actually wired to. But in 1878, the switchboard is invented, and you can now change the wire connections and talk to lots of different people. The Bell Company controlled all the service and owned all the equipment as well. You rented your phone originally from the phone company. They would hire young white women as operators because they found that, that both men and women preferred to pick up the phone and talk to a lady. They wanted to make the experience more friendly. At first, the signal was very weak, and you could only talk to somebody a few miles away. But with the invention of repeaters, the signal was strengthened, and pretty soon we could talk to people. Uh, people on the Atlantic coast could talk to people on the Pacific coast. 
Most phones in these early days were commercial. Only businesses would have them. You wouldn't have them in your home. They were very expensive. Of 7,400 lines in the New York, New Jersey area in 1891, 6,000 of those were business. The other 1,400 or so were going to be very wealthy people. A normal person would not have a phone in their home. Uh, AT&T, which was Bell's company, had a monopoly, and they controlled everything. There were simply no competitors and no other phone companies. Uh, this was a communication cartel that controlled this technology. Uh, but, of course, you can imagine the people at the time, this was a great miracle to pick up this device and be able to hear somebody's voice from miles or even thousands of miles away.